Well, it's uh, Palm Sunday, a day I used to really like. We would do special things, and I grew up in a place where there were no palm trees. So we improvised. But uh, it's a very special day as we remember what the implications of that day are for us. What Jesus did on that day, what began that week, actually it was it began before Palm Sunday. It actually began with the healing of a man named Bartimaeus. Matthew records two people who are blind who are healed. And uh, Mark and Luke, I believe, uh, just one, a man named Bartimaeus. But the point is that there is a growing world of information about coming to this Passover feast. It's not going to be just the annual Passover feast. Jesus of Nazareth is coming. And by the way, did you hear what he did when he passed through Jericho? And did you hear what he did? Did you hear it? He opened the eyes of the blind. That's significant, folks. Because only God can do that. We haven't gotten that far yet. But God can open the eyes of the blind. And so that was a big, important news item that spread from Jericho to Jerusalem. But Jesus didn't advance directly on into Jerusalem. He went to a small village called Bethany, where there was a friend of his who had recently died, had had the funeral service four days previous, and the expectation was that Jesus, who was sent word that he was sick, would come and heal Lazarus, but he didn't come. And he died. And he was buried. They had the funeral. And these are close personal friends of Jesus, and they just find it hard to understand why Jesus didn't hurry. But he had to prove himself to and, and reveal himself to them, not just as the, the, the prophet or the teacher or whatever, but as the Messiah, the one who is the resurrection and the, of the dead and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And so... We know that dramatic scene as Jesus stands in that place of burial. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And I remember what Oral Roberts used to say about that passage. He used to say, it's a good thing Jesus said Lazarus, so that it all come up. <laughs> and that may be true. Because he had the authority to raise the dead. Wow. And so that news spread to Jerusalem as well. So all these people coming to the feast, all these people hearing about the blind being healed and about the dead being raised are pretty jolly excited about the arrival of this prophet. And we know the prophecy that was fulfilled. Zechariah prophesied that their king would come to them on a donkey. And they knew that. And they heard he's getting on a donkey. Funny enough, the disciples weren't aware of the significance of that request, that it fulfilled a prophecy. A prophecy, a prophet, is a person who does what? brings the message of God. There is an aspect of foretelling, but that's not the only aspect. The most significant thing about being a prophet 
is you call people back to God. That's the consistent message of the prophets, is to return to the Lord. And whenever Israel would stray from the ways of the Lord, God would raise up a prophet. And that prophet would call them back to the ways of God. Now, Jesus is more than a prophet. He's the king. It was right for him to fulfill that because he is the king. Re recently when I spoke, I said that, what is the first, I asked that, what is the first thing we learn about Jesus when we open the Gospel of Matthew? That he is what? The son of David. He is heir to the throne. It's rightfully his. And behold, your king is coming to you riding on a donkey. And Jesus enters the city. We have a need for the supernatural. We pray for people who are facing huge issues. We are a praying congregation. And last January, I thought we drew especially close to the Lord in those 21 days. But you don't need the church elders to call a fast. You can spend time with the Lord fasting anytime you feel the need or called by Him to set aside those days or times. And I'm not talking you got to do it this way or you got to do it that way, but we're being called because there is a need for us to experience the supernatural. News events of this week give us the clear understanding that our world is hostile, increasingly hostile to the truth of the Bible. And we need to be aware of that and prepared for that. And pray that those days may not come upon us where there is persecution for being a Christian. But we run that risk. And Jesus warned us that when we follow him, we're in that risk possibility. And so we face these times soberly, seriously. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, we are told three things. We are told to pursue love. We are told to desire spiritual gifts. We are tired especially to pursue prophecy. And when we understand that we are not just to predict the future, but we're to call people. We're to call people to hope. We're to call people to life and forgiveness. We're to call people to mercy and salvation. We are to call one another to walk close to God. We are to call one another, how is it with your soul? We're to call one another, how's your spiritual life? Because we need to help one another. We're not getting the spurs in one another. We're provoking to godliness and health in our spiritual lives because we're called to be followers of Jesus. And we're in an hour and in a time when we sense his coming is close. The word Hosanna means save, Lord. 
And it's only found one place in the Old Testament. But it became the catch cry. It's found in Psalm 118. I'll just read it to you, and if you've got it in your Bible, you might want to take note of where it is. Psalm 118, Hosanna. Verse 25. Save now. Hosanna, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. It began as a cry for help and became a war cry of victory. Hosanna! That got your attention. <laughs> Hosanna! I attended a funeral this week of a friend who took me to my first footy match. It was 1972. It was the grand final. Claremont versus East Perth. Mal Brown was captain coach of East Perth. And East Perth won. And I heard a phrase that so brought joy to my heart because I realized I was really in Australia. I'd only been here, well, hadn't been here a month. And somebody scored a goal and this young boy yelled out, you little beauty! <laughs> I had never heard that before, but I was very happy. Well, if it had been a Christian event, somebody might have cried out, Hosanna! Which not only is a cry for help, but a war cry of victory. Hosanna! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! The Lord lives. When we become Christians, it is because we have invited Christ into our lives. And he comes in when we confess with our mouth his lordship and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. When we do that, we shall be saved. Some of you have heard me say before that when God saves us, he doesn't put us through a quiz program. How do you feel about Joan and the whale? You believe that? Tick. And you, you don't get the wrong idea. I, I believe in Joan and the whale. Or the fish God prepared for you to swallow him. But the point is, just a minute, I've forgotten the point. <laughs> the miracle that saves is believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. That's the miracle that saves. And I received a report from one of you this week about a friend you're sharing your faith with but they're struggling with the Lordship of Jesus too. That caught me by surprise. But he is the king. And kings may have cabinets, but they are sovereign in their rule. And Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not Lord, but Jesus is Lord. And that was, the, that was the requirement of all those who were under the rule of Rome. You had to confess that Caesar was Lord. 
but Jesus is Lord. And depending upon the political climate of the locality and under in the empire, it was determined how seriously that law was enforced. Some every public event would have first a sacrifice of incense to Caesar and carry on with their event. But God has called us within a nation and yet out of a nation to be his people in the earth. And there is the need, as we said in the beginning of this talk, for the supernatural. How does the supernatural happen? In Galatians chapter 3, we read two verses that give us insight. Galatians chapter 3. The churches of Galatia, it's a region of northwest Turkey today. These people who had become Christians under the ministry of Paul and Barnabas were now being influenced by a group of Christians from Jerusalem who called themselves Christians, but their thing was the law of Moses. If you really truly want to be a Christian, you got to be accepted into the household of Israel. And you've got to submit to the rite of circumcision. And that was especially painful. That pain was to be endured as a sign of devotion to God and submission to God and covenant relationship with God. But Jesus changed all that. You think your life went through a change? Think about becoming a first century believer when the way you found forgiveness and worship God was to bring an offering to God's house and to offer it upon the altar. And that's all over now. And you experience the agony of having done something wrong, said something you shouldn't have said, had an attitude you shouldn't have. What do you do? How are you going to get this off your back? And the way you do that is to go before the Father, to go through the Son to the Father and say, Father, I'm sorry I did that. Please forgive me. For if we fellowship with him, he will fellowship with us. And the blood of Jesus Christ will keep on cleansing us from all sin. That's the message of 1 John and Hebrews. We have a high priest. We are forgiven. And when we fail and make mistakes, we find further forgiveness. We do not wear out the forgiveness of God by needing that help and that healing. Now, we don't have to sin, and to some, that's good news today. Because you, you have other people who will tell you, well, we all sin. Well, you may occasionally, why would you want to? You don't have to sin. Galatians, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 15, brings that out clearly. Galatians chapter, sorry, Romans chapter 6, verse 15. Sorry, it's 16. Do you know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? The good point I want to leave with you today is that you don't have to sin. Because the king of come, has come and has brought further the covenant of God with people. And through him we are saved. Through him we are forgiven. Through him we find life. And we are called into his kingdom to carry out his agenda. Galatians. Verse 2. 
This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Verse 5. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? This was a, ch a group of churches that were in compromise. And yet the work of the Spirit was in their midst. I don't think we're in the kind of compromise this church, that church was in. And yet God calls us to believe for miracles, pursue love, seek spiritual gifts, especially that you may call people back to God. Hallelujah. Call people back to God. In Luke 19, we have this record of the <clears throat> Palm Sunday. Jesus weeps over the city. And he said, if you had only known the hour of your visitation. How many of you have lived through great events in your walk with the Lord and didn't realize at the time their significance. God make us aware. God make us aware of when it's his time for visitation. God make us aware. God make us aware, Carrie. God make us aware. May we not lose this hour of his visitation. We're living in a time that is unique. We are living in a time that may become risky, but we have the resource of the Holy Spirit to help us. He is our life, and life in Him is forever. So let's be encouraged in that this day. We next come to the cleansing of the temple. Dear, oh dear, what's going on? Jesus walks into his house, and there are people there selling animals at an exorbitant price, way beyond their value. But it's required, because the high priest doesn't have time to look at all the sacrifices that are brought. He only had time to do this on off hours, and these are here ready and prepared, and you have to buy one of them. Also, you can't spend your foreign money in this temple. You've got to exchange it. And unfortunately for you, the exchange rate's pretty good in our favor, and you're going to lose. Welcome to the house of God. You bunch of robbers, you bunch of thieves, and Jesus took a whip, and he went through the place, and he wasn't sweet Jesus. He was Jesus who was he was bringing the judgment of God on that situation. Jesus has the right to judge my life and judge your life because he'll do it well. Trust in him. That's what gets us through. But there were robbers in the temple. And I asked the question this morning, are there robbers in your temple? Are there issues in your life that are robbing you of the walk you know that God wants you to have? Maybe it's that you're in confusion. Maybe it's because you think, well, I just, I just don't have much of a Bible reading life. I find it hard to read the word. Or, you know, I really find it hard to pray. Or, something else. Take heart. The Holy Spirit will help you to worship. And God is wanting to encourage you, not condemn you. Strengthen you. So what do you like? 
My dad used to have a saying. Some people endure their religion. I enjoy mine. Do you enjoy your faith? You know, the enemy is in the temple. He'll attack your temple. He's not in it, but he'll attack your temple. And try to discourage you about the things of God. He'll try to discourage you that you just don't measure up. You are not good enough. You're not as smart as so-and-so. And you just don't put in the effort. And by the way, there's a perfect record of all your mistakes that I'd like to remind you of. You're a no-hoper. No offense if you're a lady named Hope or a man named Hope. <laughs> but there may be robbers attacking your temple. And today you can command in Jesus' name for those robbers to go by the authority of the blood, by the authority of the word, by the authority of the Spirit of God, you can say, go. You foul-mouthed lion devil, go in the name of Jesus. Begin to take authority. He may tempt you again. He may bring out, there may be a bit of a struggle over time as the Compromise is uprooted. Joe talked today about branches being cut, trimmed out, pruned. Lord, I don't want to miss the hour of visitation for Western Australia. I don't want to miss it for this nation. I don't want to miss it for this part of the world that you placed me. Lord Jesus, bring victory to your people and victory to me, oh Lord, I pray. Amen. We begin to pray for one another. We begin to call one another. Don't think it's being nosy if you go up. He won't think it. He doesn't mind. He asks, how's your spiritual life? I've asked him before you go stay with Help each other. Don't beat yourself up if you find it hard to pray for a certain amount of time. Don't beat yourself up. What do you like to do? My dad should have known Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And I like it in that stone edition that translated, the enjoyment of the Lord is your strength. The enjoyment of the Lord is your strength. The enjoyment of the Lord is your strength. I'll say it once more. The enjoyment of the Lord is your strength. What do you enjoy about your faith? Do that. Well, I need to balance whatever life. Christian life. I've got to do everything. No. Nope. You like to pray. But God's a matter of fact. Do you like to read the Word? Well, sometimes, uh, yeah. You know how to pray and read the Word at the same time? Pray the Psalms. That'll get you going. How many of you like to sing to the Lord? The majority. You know, the Lord enjoys it more than your peers. But the Lord enjoys it. The Lord enjoys your singing. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Joy in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities who heals all your diseases, who delivers your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving, loving what? Kindness. 
kindness and tender mercies. Thank you. Hey, enjoy the Lord. Because the children did. Jesus said in Matthew 21, except you become like little children. The disciples are arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Well, I think I am. I'm, I'm, I pray more than you do, so I'm going to be probably the one a little greater in the kingdom of God. Except you become like little children. God opened something to me a few weeks ago. I shared it with our group that meets at the Pittix. And uh, <clears throat> that was what Samuel said. You remember the Lord spoke to him and called him, and he's a little kid. I've been preaching for 50 years nearly on what it means to become a childlike, and I'm still discovering what the truth is. Not that I've been telling lies all these times, but that's a growing understanding and expanding revelation. <laughs> but I, I was struck by his instruction or his being instructed by Eli the priest you remember he's been a child that wasn't supposed to be and his mother had him and she dedicated him to, to the Lord and he served his entire life practically after he was weaned but he served that entire lifetime as a prophet and an intercessor for the people of Israel and a judge. And uh, he's a little kid. And God calls him. A little kid is called by God. A child is called by God. Children can come into their ministries in their childhood. Amen. They can prophesy before they're ten. Especially when they dance before the Lord before they're two. Hallelujah. I thank God this is an intergenerational church where we allow young people to lead us in worship. I thank God that we don't walk in the door here and parents go one way and kids go another way and neither shall meet again until everything is benedictus. But we can be affected and influenced by the ministry of children, and that's right. And children can be influenced by the, by the ministry of the adults. I said this that night in home group. You need, your children need to see you with your hands up praising God. You impact their lives. You need to see that. They need to see that. that. That's a mature and healthy and thing that mom and dad does. And we don't make a big deal about it when they do it because it's natural. When they follow suit, we give thanks in our heart to God and encourage them in their worship and, and tell them that we were blessed but we don't make examples of them. We don't exalt them. They've got some growing up to do. Three times the Lord calls Samuel. And he runs because he thinks it's... To, he runs to Eli's bedroom. And he says, you called me. You called me. And it, after two or three times, it dawns on Eli that the Lord's called on him. And Eli taught him to say this, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Your servant hears. Your servant hears. Speak, Lord. And that needs to become the cry of every person who desires to prophesy and encourage and call people back to God with the skill and insight that he will give you for that event. Speak, Lord. Your servant listens. Your servant hears. I hear you, Lord. I hear you, Lord. 
And if you need further instruction, write this down if you don't know it. If you need further instruction on how the Lord speaks to you and brings words of encouragement to you, read Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4 to 7. Isaiah chapter 50, 5, 0, 4 to 7. Well, we become like little children. We become teachable. It's hard to teach someone who knows it all. Make sure it isn't you. Keep a humble heart. Keep learning. Keep hungering. Praise the Lord. And the final thing I want to say this morning is the expectation of fruitfulness. Jesus is hungry. Jesus hasn't had breakfast. Jesus wanted figs for breakfast. He saw this fig tree over here and had all the signs of having figs on it, but he walks over to it and there's nothing there. And he says, let no person eat of you forever. And the tree dries up in 24 hours. Mark's gospel makes a see that it's a 24 hour period. Jesus expects fruitfulness from our lives. And don't wear that as a duty to be performed. May that be a realization that needs to be grasped. Or the Lord will lead you. He'll give you his spirit for the day, for each day. We remember in the morning his loving kindness, and we remember at night his faithfulness. And we declare it, and we share it. And we make it known. So brothers and sisters, God's expectation is that our lives produce the fruit of the Spirit, the way of God, the name of God. And He would put His name upon us by our being loving and kind and merciful and gracious, forgiving. I want to finish this morning by reading from James chapter 4. When you get to heaven, don't tell Martin Luther I did this. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. That you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Let's say that together but he gives more grace. Let's say it again. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. There goes on sometimes in our heads a game of fight, a war. I feel so yellow. I just don't feel like I can stand with my hands up, my face up and say praise you Lord and bless you Lord. I, I, just, I, just, I just God 
God gives grace to the humble. He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's the things you've done. And you purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. You let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He'll lift you up. Our God will lift us up today. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord.